This is Breakpoint This Week, a weekly briefing on faith, culture, worldview, and mission with John Stone Street, president of the Colson Center for Christian Worldview. Well, welcome to Breakpoint This Week. John Stone Street here, along with Shane Morris, talking about what's happening in the culture from a Christian worldview. Uh, Shane, how you doing? I'm doing great, John. Good to be on with you again. Yeah, well, we got uh, plenty of things to go to today on today's show, but one of the things that I wanted to bring up is that we've had a little bit of time, and if you uh, caught our uh, commentary this week on Planned Parenthood, Planned Parenthood's annual report is out, and uh, there's some interesting things that need to be, I think, discussed. First of all, it was a really upbeat, uh, you know, uh, annual report, which I guess isn't so unusual for nonprofits or so-called nonprofits. You know, you want to make it seem like everything's going hunky dory. But given kind of the years of bad press that Planned Parenthood has endured here, uh, bad but true press for the record uh, that they've endured, um, you know, here you are. But here's the key stat that I think needs to be parsed out a little bit. And that is that they reported that in the 2018-2019 fiscal year, they hit a record number of abortions performed. Now, first of all, again, let's just say it again, because we haven't said it enough over the last several weeks. The days of safe, legal, and rare for abortion advocates of saying, you know, this is an unfortunate choice that many have to make. Like, advocates of abortion are no longer doing that. The, you know, political advocates in particular. We also have the whole shout your abortion, you know, movement. And, of course, Planned Parenthood's now been shouting it as well. I mean, they they just let go of their, you know, most recent CEO because she didn't double down enough on uh, Planned Parenthood being an abortion provider. But this is, again, another example of, hey, this is what we do. This is what we're proud of. Yeah, I, I almost picture with the 345,000 abortions number, I almost picture like the ceiling opening up and pink balloons and streamers coming out. It's like, hey, yay, we've reached our 345,000th abortion this year. It's something to celebrate. Yeah, you're right. The language of safe, legal, and rare has gone out the window, and this is like a key metric for the organization in, in terms of their success. So, yeah, they're celebrating this. The thing that makes it ironic, John, and this is what you talked about on Breakpoint, is that the uh, statistics tell us the number of abortions nationwide are actually down. So what's happening here is Planned Parenthood is cornering the market, so to speak. They're monopolizing the industry. More and more of the abortions that do happen, even though the numbers in total are going down, are going to Planned Parenthood. So that is an interesting dynamic. That raises a lot of fascinating questions about the future of the abortion industry to me. Well, it does. I mean, it, you know, these going to kind of coalesce around kind of abortion mills, abortion giants. And we've already seen that happen, I think, more and more and more, that with any sort of regulation added to these clinics, uh, many of them have to shut down and or many of them in, end up do shutting down. And so Planned Parenthood kind of comes with their big guns and kind of runs these kind of big abortion mills. I mean, I know there's a handful and, you know, big cities uh, and the amount of abortions that they're performing on a weekly and a daily basis is just is absolutely astonishing. I mean, if you actually do think that abortion takes the life of an unborn child, it's just going to be, you know, we're talking about concentration, you know, death camp sort of uh, scales of, of numbers. And it's just absolutely stunning. Of course, there was also, a, you know, something that happened this year in this number of, you know, Planned Parenthood cornering the market or their business being, quote unquote, good. It explains, too, how quickly Planned Parenthood was willing. And this has been kind of a messaging thing back and forth. I mean, start, just a couple of years ago, they were uh, Planned Parenthood was shouting, well, it's only three percent of what we do. It's only three percent of what we do. And it's a real strange dynamic, you know, because it's three percent of what they do. But in terms of the revenue, it's more like 40 percent or more. And they were actually able to just turn down a set of specific federal grants that the – well, not turn them down, but the Trump administration passed new laws basically saying if you're a recipient of these kind of grants, you can't be an abortion provider. And that meant you know leaving millions of dollars on the table. They tried to sue. They lost. Um, you know The Ninth Circuit said, look, the Trump administration can actually do this if it wants to do that. But it tells you something about the financial solvency of the agency where basically I, you know we could do without that much money. We're not going to try to do some creative accounting like we've done before and just really stand behind – our ability and our right and our quote unquote calling that they so call have to perform abortions. Yeah, it's clear where the money's coming from too. It is abortions, like you said. I mean, there were some great 
you know, debunk videos that came out back when in 2015, I think, when the Center for Medical Progress was releasing the undercover videos and David Daladin was involved there, where Planned Parenthood had made this claim that abortion is only 3% of what they do. And it really was an accounting trick. It was like, uh, I saw one comparison that was particularly good. It was as if McDonald's had said, well, burgers are only 3% of what we do because we're counting each individual fry as a service. You know, that was essentially what Planned Parenthood was doing with contraceptives and so forth. But those are not their high dollar items. Abortion is their high dollar item. And evidently, with charitable donations and abortions and the existing federal funding, they are able to turn down some money, leave it on the table in favor of continuing what they see as their core mission. Yeah, and then at the same time, they are still receiving an enormous amount of money at the hands of taxpayers, and including federal funding. But overall, both federal and state level funding, I mean, there's still the organization still receiving over six hundred million dollars a year, and we still have an inability or an unwillingness by politicians. And I, I know people point their finger at the president for what he promised. And uh, but I you know I spend most of my time pointing at congressional leaders who who ran on these platforms right and said you know we're going to defund Planned Parenthood or we're going to cut the funding of Planned Parenthood and their way of fulfilling that promise is what I've been told is kind of the status quo not giving any more money to Planned Parenthood it's like how much more money does this organization need at some level if you're going to run on a platform that says we're going to defund Planned Parenthood then start actually doing it. And I think increasingly what we're seeing are pro-life organizations stepping in and not just providing anti-abortion counseling, pro-adoption counseling, but you know what else? Many of them are actually moving into the women's health space, providing the same sort of services for uh, women, holistic centers, and which would make them eligible, I think, increasingly for some government funding. So look, there's not a service that Planned Parenthood provides that can't be offered in other ways, particularly if it's coming at the hands of an organization that's not not killing children. Well, not a legitimate service, right? Yeah, I think you made exactly the right point in the commentary on this, John, that um, Planned Parenthood would be crippled financially overnight if the federal funding were withdrawn, if that dried up. And it's a significant portion of the organization's budget. I mean, we know that. Yet we had a Republican Congress for two years, like you said, and nothing was done. And as far as the president's campaign promises go, he you know, stood ready to sign that kind of legislation. Now, I don't know whether he put the necessary pressure on congressional leaders to get that done. Maybe not. But now it probably won't get done for a very long time because the Democrats are in control of the House. So and that is unless there's a massive change of heart among a lot of Democratic legislators or and there, well, there is, and there has to be a massive change of heart as well among you know voters. And you know, this is one of the things as we looked at 2020. In fact, this past week on the Breakpoint.org website, we hosted one of our uh, online symposium had 14 or 15 Christian thought leaders from different walks of culture weigh in on, you know, what are the most important issues for Christians to think about in 2020? And obviously, one of the ones is the election. Now, we we always say, you know, uh, Shane, that politics tends to be uh, downstream from culture. But at the same time, politics is a big part of culture. And politics is a something that actually matters. It's not all that matters. That's the danger of the political illusion. And we see that in a number, in a number of ways today, both by those who think that Everything rides for the good on the presidential election, and everything will come you know, to disaster because of the presidential election. I mean, both of those things are examples of the political illusion, if you ask me. But there's also the reality that elections do matter, and people should vote. And at some level, if we really believe that politically speaking, abortion should be un- off the table, it should be unthinkable, and certainly that our federal funds uh, should not go in that direction. Well, well, then we need to actually vote that way. By the way, one of the things that we've got coming up here to help you kind of think through that is our next Colson Center short course, which is on Christianity and politics, preparing for the 2020 election. And, you know, I was thinking as we were kind of putting this course together, Shane, of this uh, wonderful football reference, and, and so I'm throwing this out realizing that this may be law Lost on you. Uh, you are you are merciless, record. John. You're absolutely merciless. <laughs> so football is a game that no, there, there's a, I think there's a story. I think I was actually speaking to a group last week, and I used this illustration, and I appealed to the football coach in the room, and he's like, I've never heard of that. So I might actually completely be making this up, but I'm pretty sure it was a Vince Lombardi, who's one of the great football coaches in history. When he took over Green Bay, he went back, got all the guys together. 
held up a football and said, now, gentlemen, this is a football. In other words, like, we're going to go back to the basics and start from the beginning. And that's really what we had in mind for this short course is that there's been so much noise, politically speaking, and so much hand-wringing on one side and anger on the other side and all kinds of back and forth and the issues uh, – you know, who do we align with and what's the guilt by association and all kinds of things that we wanted to go back to first principles and, and start by having come, some of those kind of baseline conversations. You know, instead of, you know, gentlemen, this is a football, it's first of all the first session with Wayne Grudem, who's written kind of a masterful book on the Bible and politics. You know, gentlemen, this is politics according to the Bible. And then Bruce Ashford, who's written a terrific book on being a citizen and the responsibility of being a Christian citizen, will be joining us. Mindy Belts, our, one of our favorites from World Magazine, will be talking about all the issues that matter, particularly those that are especially hot right now. And then Jay Richards, uh, who's joined us for a number of short courses, is going to specifically tackle the new attraction to socialism, which seems uh, to especially have a hold on young people. And uh, anyway, that's our next short course. It's going to start in the month of February. Come to breakpoint.org to find out more about this next short course. There's limited space available, and these short courses typically fill up quickly. So come and sign up as soon as you can for our next short course on politics and the Bible. You're listening to Breakpoint point this week with Shane Morris and John Stone Street. We'll be right back. We invite you to visit breakpoint.org. And while you're at our website, be sure to browse our online Colson Center store of books and other resources. And you can find links to our social media sites like Facebook and Twitter. We're back on Breakpoint this week. John Stone Street here along with Shane Morris. Shane, we ended the last segment. I was telling folks about our next short course, which is really going to be special. It's a great lineup of thinkers who have helped Christians uh, think about their responsibility as what I think Aristotle called being political animals, right? The eminent Dr. Wayne Grudem, uh, Dr. Jay Richards, Dr. Bruce Ashford, Mindy Belts from World Magazine. I mean, this is going to be a wonderful short course. But that final one with uh, Jay Richards is going to deal with a question that I want to spend a little bit of time on here for the next few minutes, because there was an interesting conversation that came up amongst a group of our Colson Fellows. And if you don't know about Colson Fellows, this is our one-year study program. It, uh, there's uh, 30-some different communities in America that host a small group walking through a one-year curriculum of Christian worldview and cultural renewal. And the group in Colorado Springs, and, and I know a little bit about this group because my wife leads that group, and she came back from the residency on Saturday and said, you know, we just had an amazing conversation because there are two millennials in that group, and the question came up, uh, why is the younger generation more attracted to socialism? You know, what's behind all of that? And they had some fascinating insights that I want to share with everyone, because I think it's worth thinking about, you know, before we just kind of go off and roll our eyes about how silly the younger generation is for, you know, not watching the news about Venezuela. Yeah, the, the, with the socialism thing, I mean, I don't know what the insights um, that came out of the small group were. That's I'm fascinated to hear that. But the thing I continually encounter, John, is a sort of confusion at the root of that opinion, and that it's a confusion between what's been called the Scandinavian model and then more orthodox by the books socialism, of which you count communism, for instance, a, a subset. And um, I think what most millennials and Gen Z members who endorse socialism or express a, a, a liking for that form of government are talking about the Scandinavian model. I think they're talking about social democracies where there's a big social safety net, but then a lot of uh, you know private property rights and so forth, and a lot of room for capitalism. So, I mean, that's something to clear away right away. Socialism is one of those terms like liberalism that's kind of used equivocally. But I think the the other underlying thing I run into a lot is the assumption that there are that all problems that our country faces are political that are, you know, whether social, economic, familial, it all comes down to politics. And if we get the right policies in place, then, you know, everything's going to be fixed. And that's the vision of socialism. And to be clear, that's an infliction of both the left and the oh, right, it is, right? Absolutely. I mean, that's not, the political illusion is not just something on the left. It is something on the right as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as much as we may be tempted during election years like this to see uh, a candidate or an office holder or a party as the sort of avatar of all that's right and true and good, that's really a broken way of thinking. And not only does that lead to great disappointment, um, when politics fails to deliver, but it also uh, leads to intractable division. It just you're just constantly butting heads with the other party because they're evil. 
Yeah, you know what I think, though? I think in our age, and I think in particular the last three or four election cycles, that what we have seen is the political illusion less in if my guy wins, all will be well. Right. And we see it far more in if this guy wins, all will fall apart. Right? right the negative And side. I think you actually see that. Right. And, and now, listen, to be honest, I mean, elections do matter, right? I mean, there's it could legitimately be argued, and it is, that if the last election had gone, for example, a different way, that the Supreme Court would have been gone a different way for generations to come. And it's really hard to argue with that, you know, especially if this presidency extends into eight years instead of four years. I mean, this was a significant replacement on the court of, of, of two justices. And we saw, you know, how much both sides felt were at stake when that took place. Mm-hmm. I want to share with you, though, two insights that these um, Colson fellows who are millennials, like you, Shane, you know, who are... Uh, I'm outed. <laughs> uh, don't say, okay, boomer, because I'm an Xer. We're the sandwich generation that really were completely... I, I saw a great life, meme, so. John, real quick. It was a picture of Darth Vader and Luke fighting... And, you know, Darth Vader cutting off Luke's hand and it said boomers and millennials. And then there was Han Solo off to the side just kind of shrugging. It said Gen X. (laughs) Gen X, yeah, yeah, that's pretty much us. But um, there was two insights they brought up that I thought were particularly helpful. Uh, Number one was they said, you know, at the end of the day, we've never grown up in a church that talked about this stuff. That was a really profound thing. I mean, you talk about especially a common evangelical experience for that age group. It's been very seeker-friendly. It's been very oftentimes very emotional. Uh, there's been a real avoidance of anything that's quote-unquote too political you know, because of a backlash of the, against the 80s or whatever. And so that was one of their points. In fact, I believe, if I got this story correct, that the Colson fellow who actually said it you know, basically said, you know, we want the church to tell us more what to believe. And this isn't unlike what you and I talked about uh, a couple months ago in a breakpoint commentary about uh, Mayor Pete, Pete Buttigieg, right? That when the church is quiet on uh, social issues, then when somebody else comes in and applies the Bible to social issues, you know, even if it's ridiculous the way Mayor Pete has done it, arguing for things that are just completely, you know, unjustifiable on any level of taking the text seriously. Well, you know, there you have it. That's actually, uh, you know, a very compelling argument simply because no one actually says anything. So I thought that was a really interesting take. The other thing that they said, and this is, I think, really important, is that their historical memory doesn't go back to a socialist threat, you know, that it doesn't go back to, you know, the Cold War or anything like that. In fact, they came of age and the economic threat was capitalism. It was the 2008 financial collapse. Now, many people could say, whoa, 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 that's not capitalism. That's crony capitalism. That's certainly not celebrating the free market. That's something that everybody is against, which is exactly what we would say. Yeah, nothing says right? free, but that's free not market what their teacher like said. multi billion dollar bailouts to, you know, failed companies. <laughs> But that's who who was, quote unquote, guilty as charged, right? I mean, and that's the story that they've heard. And the one who fixed it, the one who, you know, saved the little man was the state, you know, by offering these bailouts and, you know, protecting the consumer and things like that. So it's a very short historical memory. And, of course, we're talking about a historical memory that hasn't had any sort of complemented or grounding in a civic education of any sort, right, that you could point to. And Oz Guinness, among others, has said, look, unless we figure out the civic education thing, we've got no no hope for a future. And I think that's exactly right. Yeah, the hope in socialism is, I mean, it's grounded in so many philosophical fallacies, fallacies of the way you think about um, just geopolitics. I mean, look at the world and you see the long line of failures in socialist countries. The only model that it has ever showed any degree of success is significantly mixed with capitalism. So yeah, and, and Oz Guinness has been great on that. Every single one of his books where he touches on politics, he deals with these issues on a deep worldview level, not just sort of a basic political analysis. Yeah, and Oz Guinness is going to be back with us at the Wilberforce Weekend this May, May 14th through the 17th. We've actually got an incredible lineup, including not only Oz Guinness, but also Lee Strobel and Andy Crouch. 
and one of the pr- most incredible pro-life leaders that you've never heard of because she's leading pro-life Africa. Her name is Obianuju Eki Osha. At least that's what I'm going to say her name is. I'm going to commit to that one, because that pronunciation, because it sounds really good. I may be close. And, the, and then when she uh, corrects well you at the podium at Wilberforce Weekend, you can be embarrassed in front of everyone, and it'll be great. I'll be sufficiently embarrassed. Right. But yeah, she goes by Uju, which is really helpful. But I've been following uh, Uju on Twitter for years and just watching her just stand up for the unborn by basically chastising what she calls Western ideological imperialism. You know, basically I've heard her say on more than one occasion, you know, to those trying to promote quote unquote women's reproductive health on the continent of Africa, Africans don't kill their kids. Maybe you Westerners do, but we Africans don't kill our kids. And that's ideological imperialism. And it's a profound argument. And she's been a champion of life and she's going to be a lot of fun to talk to and, and really inspiring as well. Not to mention the great Max McLean. Max McLean, of course, uh, known for his dramatizations of uh, the screw tape letters, the life of C.S. Lewis, just really one of those remarkable people bringing uh, truth to bear in the arts in New York City and many more. Come to WilberforceWeekend.org, WilberforceWeekend.org to join us in Washington, D.C., Uh, May 14th through the 17th. Uh, It's going to be an incredible weekend and one not to miss. You're listening to Breakpoint This Week with Shane Morris and John Stone Street. We'll be right back. You can learn more about Breakpoint and the Colson Center for Christian Worldview when you visit breakpoint.org. That's breakpoint.org. Well, we're back on Breakpoint this week. John Stone Street here along with Shane Morris. Uh, Shane here, as we close out today's program, it's important, I think, to mention uh, two great individuals who have passed this week. And the first uh, goes back to Sunday. We talked about it on a Breakpoint commentary this past week. You heard some of uh, the great conservative intellectuals this week kind of voice tribute to Sir Roger Scruton who was really a renaissance man and one of the great thinkers, particularly in the area of beauty. That's what we talked about. But then more recently, uh, lost another important figure, and I know he's someone that that you uh, specifically appreciated. Yeah, John, uh, as we record this, only a few hours ago, the story came out that um, from the Tolkien Society that Christopher Tolkien uh, had died at the age of 95. For those who don't know, the first name there, but the second name sounds very familiar. He's the third son of J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. He uh, drew the famous original Lord of the Rings maps um, and decorated the books released back in the 50s during the you know peak of his father's success. But uh, Christopher is, for hardcore Tolkien fans, he's a lot more than that because he's been the steward of his father's legacy and work for so long and in much more than just managing his estate. He's actually edited, compiled, and um, finished up a huge body of work that his father had uh, left behind unfinished and published that posthumously. So we have uh, Christopher Tolkien to thank for things like uh, The Silmarillion and The Children of Hurin, The Fall of Gondolin, uh, Baron and Luthien, all these books that flesh out the world that we're more familiar with from The Lord of the Rings. So his passing is like the end of the Inklings for many people because he was in many ways, the great late contributor to his father's work. And when we talked about Roger Scruton, I see a really strong connection between these two men and their legacies, because his work on beauty in particular, which is what we talked about on Breakpoint, in many ways, what he described, Christopher Tolkien lived out on an almost unimaginable Mm -hmm. scale. You know, his father came up with whole languages and cultures and histories and dynasties, complete with, with the whole mythological systems, invented for the love of beauty and together with an unmistakable Christian echo. That's one of the things that's just so beloved about the world of Middle Earth or Arda for those who are a little more initiated into the mythology. But I love what (laughs) C.S. Lewis said about uh, Tolkien's work that after reading The Lord of the Rings, he said, here are beauties which pierce like swords and burn like cold iron. Here is a book which will break your heart. And that was what Roger Scruton taught about beauty was that it, it draws you up, you know, into something higher and better and truer than your everyday experiences and appetites. And, you know, and part of that is believing that beauty has an objective nature, that it's not just beauty in the eye of the beholder. And in fact, there's a tremendous 2009 BBC documentary. I know you and I both watched it this week uh, when we heard of the death of Sir Roger Scruton uh, called Why Beauty Matters, in which he specifically deals with the loss that happens to culture when you lose an objective sense of beauty. 
uh, that, in other words, if beauty is up in the eye of the beholder, then a, you know, what we see in many art museums today, and I don't know about you, Shane, but there's plenty of times I walk through an art museum and I think I can do that, you know, and I, then I know if I can do it, it's not beautiful because I don't have any skill. But divorcing beauty from skill, divorcing art from actual objective reality and objective skill impoverishes a culture because we actually lose one of the things that's part of the world that connects us to transcendence. I mean, right? I mean, when you experience beauty, you're transported, you're reflective, you're thinking different thoughts, higher thoughts. You're not just concerned about the next breath or the next thing. You're thinking about even eternal things. And there's very few things in our world that can do that to us and catch us off guard. But the things that are there's something objectively different about them. But, of course, we live in a culture that for 30 years has been ridding itself of objective morality, and it's a small step from objective morality to losing objective reality. And I think that was a big part of uh, Sir Roger Scruton's contribution is grounding our thoughts and those things that are real as a grounding for conservatism. And, I, I you know, it, it's a big loss because there's not nearly enough people that are helping us think through beauty on this scale anymore. Yeah, and, and grounded not just objectively, but ultimately objective grounding is in the nature of God himself, who is beautiful, who is beauty itself. And there's this amazing passage from one of the books that Christopher Tolkien actually published after his father's death, you know, based on all of his notes. It's at the beginning of the Silmarillion, and, and it illustrates this so perfectly. I think what Roger Scruton is talking about and then what um, Christopher Tolkien devoted his life to, it's called The Music of the Ainur, and it's uh, a moment in which Tolkien's god figure, he begins this song with which he's bringing the world into existence. And the angels are all singing along with him, and then this head angel called Melkor, who, spoiler alert, becomes the devil of that world, introduces these other themes. He starts trying to sort of Jackson Pollock it. You know, he starts to introduce discord and disharmony. And he says, I'm going to be original. I'm going to make something that's truly my own, that's not rooted in God's nature and his themes. And uh, the God of this world, Iluvatar, he comes back and, and says that basically, well, you can try, but you're never going to create something that doesn't have its ultimate origin in me, in which I cannot turn back to greater beauty than you ever imagined. I love that. It's one of my favorite expressions of the idea of beauty and what's at its core and why it's rooted in um, God's very nature. So we're going to end this program with giving everyone some homework assignments. First, go and find the 2009 BBC documentary, Why Beauty Matters. It's actually free on YouTube uh, with Sir Roger Scruton. And watch it. And watch it with your kids. Watch it with your teenage uh, sons and daughters, your, the young adults in your life, and wrestle through this concept of beauty from a Christian worldview. Yeah. And uh, if you can't find it, come to breakpoint.org and click on the link there for this program, and we'll add it to the show notes, as well as some resources on uh, uh, Chris Tolkien. And um, just you know things that Shane has mentioned in today's program. I'm not as nearly as nerdy in Middle Earth as Shane is, uh, so we're gonna we've, we're gonna let him. We finally pop. found your football, John. <laughs> this is a football. Yeah. Well, come to breakpoint.org, and we'll link you to some resources on on his great work as well. For Shane Morris, I'm John Stone Street. Thanks for joining us on Breakpoint this week.